so I'm excited to talk about machine learning for biological sequence design. I think this is a nascent field where there's lots of exciting opportunity and I really encourage people to get involved because there are tons and tons of questions and not that many people working on these problems. Uh, so I'm really interested in the problem of learning to predict protein function from sequence. And when I say protein function, there's many, many different things that that might mean. And typically, I'm going to mean something that we can measure experimentally. So it's really dictated by the assay that my experimental collaborator can carry out. And of course, just sort of backing up a bit, you know, we all know that proteins are synthesized as these long polypeptide chain, 20 naturally occurring amino acids, at least most commonly making up the elements of that sequence or chain. Everyone is really familiar with the protein structure prediction problem. Uh, we've all heard about the sort of recent success of AlphaFold, AlphaFold2, and many other approaches to this problem. But of course, you know, even once we've established this beautiful structure uh, for GFP, this really nice beta barrel structure here, it's actually very difficult to figure out from that structure whether that protein is going to fluoresce green or cyan or red or whatever color happens to have been engineered in. In order to, 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 to figure that out, we typically actually have to make the protein um, and uh, measure or see what color it uh, produces. So there are very, very proteins that are very, very structurally similar, that have very similar sequences that end up acting quite differently in terms of function. And of course, you know, the color of this protein is just one sort of categorical measurement that we might make. We also might be interested in how brightly it fluoresces, how quickly it folds, folds, how stable it is. There are all sorts of functions you might want to measure and getting from structure to those functions can be really quite difficult. And so I'm very excited about going directly from sequence to function and building models that can make accurate predictions uh, for that particular task. And we're very fortunate because nature does countless experiments using mutation and selection in order to find good proteins. And so we have access to numerous sequences. There's lots and lots of data, which is a great spot in which to try and use machine learning. There's a plot here uh, from January this year. This is from EBI showing the growth of sequence data at EBI in uh, Cambridge. And you can see that there is something like 2.8 billion sequences. This was just a couple of months ago, but I bet that number is now higher. Uh, it goes up extremely quickly. This is on a log scale and it shows no sign of slowing down. Um, in terms of measuring function, however, we're considerably behind being able to determine sequence. There are a few sort of canonical large data sets where people have measured the function of thousands of proteins. And I'm showing here, this is an illustration of the landscape of fluorescence intensity of GFP that was measured by the Kondrashov group back in 2015 or 2016. Um, so here the wild type sequence is right at the center. And you can see that as you move out, as you make mutations to that sequence, uh, the, the function typically kind of drops off. So the function is being shown here in the Z direction in this 3D plot. You can see there are a few points that have higher Z values, very few. And the vast majority of those 56,000 really drop off rapidly as you get away from that starting sequence. So making changes to the sequence generally makes things worse, uh, at least if we're trying to increase the intensity of the fluorescence. Um, but we do have lots and lots of data. And what is even more exciting is that we can actually generate a lot of this data. So the, the, the experimental technologies have really moved on in the last few years such that we can now synthesize large sets of exact protein sequences and measure their activity in high throughput assays. And I think that's the key breakthrough that really makes all of this tractable. Um, so how can we exploit this wealth of data to discover new proteins is the key question. And one approach to this has really been using directed evolution. A really famous technique uh, involves making changes. And here this is meant to sort of indicate random mutagenesis as lightning here. So we're gonna make changes to this protein in a somewhat random fashion and then test them in the lab and then keep those ones that perform best, um, potentially without even knowing what their sequences are and, and put them sort of into the assay again. So we've got to kind of go around this loop 
keeping the best sequences or best variants every time and then mutating them further in order to try and make them better. So we can sort of think about that, that as being random local search and selection. It doesn't have to be random. You can direct it by making mutations at restricted numbers of sites, for example, or restricting to particular types of amino acids, but it's not, it doesn't usually involve designing exact sequences. So you're kind of relying on the power of brute force search to get you uh, a better function. And direct evolution is really great as long as you're climbing uphill in the landscape, but unfortunately it has problems when it comes to crossing valleys. So say you're trying to improve the fitness of a particular sequence variant or a particular wild type sequence, and there's a really great sequence far away in the landscape that's across a couple of valleys, finding that by directed evolution would be really difficult. And so the idea here is simply to try and expand this loop in order to in include machine learning or modeling into the loop. And so you would sort of make specific variants here with this little screwdriver rather than the lightning. So you're being a bit more targeted in how you change the protein, test them, and then use that data to update a model that describes the relationship between the sequence or some kind of representation or embedding of the sequence and the measured functional activity. And so this is a very simple landscape in 3D or even 2D. Um, of course, the actual landscape is horribly high dimensional and impossible to draw or visualize. Um, and so that's why I've resorted to this very simple representation. Mm. Once we have that landscape, what the key challenge is to be able to walk and move in the landscape and potentially, rather than just accessing this local peak here, which is what would likely happen with directed evolution, given the slopes, we'd like to be able to get to this distant peak over here, or ideally find both. And I think being able to find diverse good sequences is one of the possibilities that machine learning opens up. So there's a few different steps involved in this whole uh, challenge, um, essentially figuring out how to build these models from experimental data and also how to generate the kind of data that's useful to build these models, I think are really important challenges. And then once we have this model, so once we have this sort of nice landscape shown on the right, of course, being able to optimize the model and select the most informative next batch of sequences in order to test in an experimental assay um, in itself is an interesting challenge. So overall, using both evolutionary, I mean, we have millions and billions of sequences, it would be crazy not to figure out how to leverage information from them, um, and also experimental data to train machine learning models that relate protein sequence directly to function uh, in order to accelerate the search and discover new proteins. Um, it's really going to take up the rest of this talk. Just to go in a little bit more detail, there are sort of three key areas I'll talk about, one of which is learning sequence representations or embeddings. Um, we have been learning them from raw unaligned sequences. You can also learn useful embeddings or representations from aligned sequences. And there's lots of approaches here and I'm not sure that anyone has figured out how to do a good job of this just yet. But the point is to learn this representation or space where proximity tells us about functional activity. Then we need to use ideally some initial label data uh, to build and calibrate a model of the relationship between sequence and whatever phenotype we're interested in, um, in a particular task. And so then we'd be building that model using the sequence representation and, and just learning um, that particular set of relationships. Um, and then finally, we need to solve this optimization problem. So we have to really find good sequences, ideally good diverse sequences, which involves a little bit more thinking about how not to just focus on a single peak. Um, and sequences are very close to each other uh, that, that, that have are all very similar. Um, okay, so I'll talk about sort of four different areas briefly, um, starting by figuring out how to use deep learning or deep models to, to, to learn embeddings from um, unsupervised or unlabeled data. And then I'll talk a little bit more in, in detail about how to uh, how we've used in silico problems or oracles to develop and compare model-based optimization strategies. Um, we then developed some novel strategies to optimize large batches. 
one of the nice things about this technology is that you can test many sequences at a time. And so you have to think about how to leverage the fact that you can test a thousand or 10,000 sequences in a single batch. Um, it's a little bit different from cases where you get sequential information from doing multiple experiments, um, one after the other, uh, which is more typical in this sort of machine learning setting. Like if you're playing Go or chess or some kind of computer game, then you typically make moves one at a time rather than making a thousand moves at once. Um, and so it's a bit of a different problem, which is interesting from a machine learning point of view. Um, and then finally, I'll go into details about some experimental validation uh, that shows that sometimes at least this can work. So in the first case, using deep learning, uh, deep models to learn embeddings, we were sort of taken by this statement that was published in a paper in Nature back in 2018, which is that one third of all protein coding genes from bacterial genomes simply can't be annotated with a function. And I was quite sort of surprised by this. And it turns out this is actually really a lower bound. If you talk to people in the protein annotation community, uh, they'd say that this is you know, probably more like 50% or most of the data that we have actually can't be annotated with a function. Um, and that's surprising because you know, people have worked a lot on this problem and there are some really successful tools out there. Um, but if we're going to exploit all this data that we've been collecting, it seems useful to be able to functionally annotate it. Um, and so we started off by kind of focusing on PFAM, which is a really nice database of protein functional annotations. Um, it annotates domains, which you can view as the functional or evolutionary conserved parts of a protein. Um, and basically there are two parts to PFAM. There's a seed database, which is maybe one and a half million sequences. Uh, of, these are really well-known sequences that are used to build HMM models. And there's a lot of manual curation that has gone into, in the past, uh, the structure uh, of, of PFAM seeds and the, particularly the alignment for each family. Uh, the seed alignment for each family is usually carefully um, curated. Uh, and so there's some amount of actual kind of human information in there. PFAM4, on the other hand, is grown using hidden marker models that are fit on the data in PFAM seed. So we felt that training models on PFAM4 would be a bit circular because we'd just be training on the hidden Markov model labeled data. On the other hand, training models on PFAM seed seem to actually uh, potentially introduce uh, human verified information. And so that's what we did. We trained a bunch of models on PFAM seed. There are something like 18,000 different classes. So there's one and a half million sequences, 18,000 classes. That's an awful lot of small classes, particularly because the class distribution uh, in terms of size varies a lot. And we used a very sort of standard ResNet model. So this is a uh, model that has a number of convolutional layers. Each convolutional layer uh, contains uh, residual blocks and you can vary the number of residual blocks. It's one of the hyperparameters and their structure is shown here on the left. Um, but basically you put amino acid sequences in, they're not aligned, they can be any length. Um, literally we tried putting uh, Titan in, which is something like 33,000 amino acids long, and it works just fine. Uh, they're then, you know, just one hot encoded and padded, put through the network, and we learn a fixed length representation for each sequence. And this sort of gives some idea, this is just a PCA of that representation showing the first couple of principal components. And you can see that similar or sequences with the same labels cluster in this space. And so then we're just uh, training like a classifier on top of that representation. So it's, it's, this is not a particularly sort of complicated model, um, but it does, it turns out, work pretty well. I'm showing here confusingly error rate on the y-axis of this plot. So of course we want the error rate to be lower and our ensemble of neural networks does particularly well. This is showing performance for a randomly split held out test set as a function of the distance to the nearest training sequence. So these sequences over here are hard, they're only 10%, 20% identical to anything in the training set. And these sequences over here are much easier. You can see that all the models perform better for sequences that are close to the training data, um, but the ensemble of neural networks does particularly well. And we basically reduce the number of errors by roughly speaking a factor of 10 um, over uh, the sort of HMM-based, uh, alignment-based, uh, sort of top pick 
approach. And so we were excited by that. We felt that it meant that the neural networks were really learning something different. We have similar results using a clustered spit, which I haven't included in this talk, but perhaps more interesting is the fact that deep learning really provides complementary information to existing methods. So if I ensemble, uh, in this case, the HMM shown in orange and our ensemble of neural networks shown in blue, if I just take that ensemble a bit further and, and, and combine those two, then I actually get a model that performs better than either of the component models. On the other hand, if I ensemble HMM and BLAST-P, then I don't get any gain over the HMM performance. So somehow, H, you know, the hidden Markov model and BLAST are, are leveraging the same information, whereas the deep learning is, is doing something different. It's able to uh, pick up on different signals, uh, which seems like an exciting event. We then realized that if we trained our models on just the seed sequences from version 32, we could actually annotate a bunch more data than the HMMs were able to annotate. And so this is like, you know, sort of showing that we could have added somewhere between three and four million annotations to PFAM uh, back when we first did this, which was um, a few years, a couple of years ago now. Um, and recently we leveraged that and actually trained models using the new release of PFAM full, we were able to release with uh, the help of EBI and put this up on their FTP server, uh, something called PFAM N, which has a whole bunch of additional annotations uh, which are made by the models trained on this PFAM version 34 that was just released a few weeks ago. And so that was really exciting for us. Um, we're really hopeful that these models can sort of continue moving forward and contribute to this effort. But in a sense, the sort of the whole reason that we train these models was to learn useful embeddings so that we could then build models for protein discovery. Um, so that was sort of how that part of the work fits into this talk. So given now that we have these representations or we have a representation, the next step is being able to actually um, develop and compare model-based optimization strategies. So how are we going to learn models from experimental data and use them to design new sequences. And so I'll talk first a little bit about some work using in silico oracles, by which I mean kind of made up problems where we get to, to, to control the landscape. And so, you know, this was, we've gone through section one here, looking at how to learn embeddings. And we're now thinking about section two, how can we really use initial label data to, to build these models and move forward. So, of course, you know, working with in silico benchmarks isn't perfect. They don't reflect the reality of an experimental sequence optimization task. And we're just doing this to kind of put the pieces in place so that we can work on the experimental problem. But we can make things a little bit more realistic by including some of the constraints of the experiment, for example, the batch size, the number of rounds uh, that we typically find working with a lab, wet lab, and so on and so forth. We can include uh, initial labeled and unlabeled data sets. Um, and it allows us to really develop metrics uh, for the quality and diversity of the sequences that we find. But you know, there are lots of problems here, like what should our landscape look like? Um, how spiky should it be? All those are, are questions that we're not even gonna pretend to be able to answer. So for thinking about model-based optimization, this is the sort of loop that we're working with up in the top left-hand corner here, we have real experiments, uh, which are expensive and take a long time. Even in these days of high throughput uh, experiments and synthesis on demand, this still takes, I would say, roughly speaking, a month as an experimental loop, um, and it's not that cheap. So we're going to get experimental labels, which here are denoted by F for some of our sequences, um, but we're also going to use that data and fit models, uh, which we'll call F prime, uh, which are in silico and much cheaper to evaluate. So we have some amount of data, we're gonna fit a model on that set of labels, uh, sequences and labels. And then we're going to define an acquisition function, which just means that we want to trade off between sort of optimizing the model that we have and exploring the space where our model currently does badly um, in order to uh, improve or expand the domain over which the model is accurate. So the acquisition function just sort of formalizes that and there are a bunch of different um, approaches to how we construct that acquisition function. Uh, we then want to optimize it 
So, you know, identify those sequences that we think would be most useful to test next. Uh, we can do this in a sample inefficient way because this is all in silico. So we can use approaches like RL or evolution or cross entropy. Um, and then once we've found those optima, which I've called here, of max of A of X, so just the best sequences, we can actually go and put those back into the experiment. So that's a sort of overall loop. Um, we really wanted to figure out how to make this model-based optimization approach more robust. So we found that you know, sometimes it did well, sometimes it did badly, even for our in silico problems. Um, and we found a few ways of making it more robust, in particular, using automatic model selection. So we could consider, train lots and lots of models. It's cheap, this is in a computer, um, and compare them all against each other for every problem that we were working on. Um, and at each round, we can select the best models based on some score using cross-validation within the trained data. And that allows the model complexity to adapt the amount of data. So we could start off using simple models. We don't have that much data. And then as we sort of progress through a couple of rounds, the complexity of the models can increase. And that's all kind of automatically controlled just by using these metrics uh, that we're fitting constantly. Um, also, we're only going to use the model if it's accurate enough. So again, leveraging those metrics. And we really need to be careful to constrain where the model walks in the space. So in this illustration here, you can see that the, the model might have many, many ideas about where good sequences are. Um, but you know, we're, we're going to sort of constrain where we allow it to walk um, because the models tend to be very imaginative um, and we walk off the sort of known manifold, then uh, the model can really think they're good sequences, even though they aren't necessarily actually there. So we used, we sort of made this uh, variant of a reinforcement approach, which we call Dyna PPO. It's a model based variant of a one known algorithm called PPO. Um, which essentially enforces uh, those um, techniques that I talked about. Um, we start off training with real data, and then if we have a model that's accurate enough, we can actually train further using simulated data, um, constantly sort of updating as we go. And essentially, really want to um, address bias and stop training if the model kind of wanders off and becomes inaccurate. And one way that we can judge that. Of course, you know, the real world, we don't have access to the model error, but we do have access to the model uncertainty. So if we you know, train several versions of a model, we can, we can me measure the uncertainty simply by looking at the standard deviation of the trajectories. And that turns out to correlate really pretty well with the error. And so we can set a threshold on that uncertainty um, and stop. In this case, in the second round, we would have stopped you know, um, after some number of rounds of optimization um, and, and gone and collected some more data. In the third round, we could have gone a bit further before collecting more data. And then the later rounds, we're really able to roll all the way out and keep going. Um, so we built this set of in silico problems. There are many versions of each of these categories of problem. Uh, the first one is a transcription factor binding data set that it was experimentally collected that we uh, could use and, uh, as an optimization problem. The second one is a bunch of models made using uh, some of the approaches to protein uh, structure prediction, some of the models that, that underlie the recent approaches such as AlphaFold. And this is an antimicrobial peptide data set, uh, which is again, a uh, experimental data set that we fit. And what we're showing here is we're comparing several different approaches to model-based optimization, which are in different colors uh, and the random is a sort of very simple baseline that never really does very well. Um, but our uh, this, this reinforcement learning based approach um, is able to rapidly find uh, or find a good sequence. It sort of goes up very quickly. Um, if we're thinking about these as rounds of a thousand or two thousand sequences, you know, we can, that's another parameter we can control. And you can see that you're able to rapidly find good sequences uh, using some approaches, whereas using others it takes much longer. So. We were excited that it does seem possible to really improve performance based on what model-based optimization strategy you use. We also realized that we had this additional factor of how we construct the batch that we haven't yet exploited. And we still had this problem that model-based optimization, you know, while it worked well, didn't always work the best. So it still wasn't particularly robust. 
Um, and so if we are going to test many sequences in a parallel, it seemed like we could perhaps exploit this to address this robustness problem. And so we came up with a strategy which we call population-based black box optimization or P3BO, um, which if you say it quickly, reminds you of a character from a movie. Um, essentially what we have been doing or what people have sort of done with single algorithms is just take a single batch filled by sequences um, from suggested by that algorithm. But instead, of course, we can combine multiple algorithms and give them each part of the batch. Uh, and in this way, we can also adjust how much the batch they get, depending on how well they're doing over subsequent rounds. Um, and it allows sort of information to be exchanged between these different algorithms. They're all exploring, they're off kind of exploring different parts of the space. And so, you know, um, in a sense, even if they were copies of the same model, they would have different information, or they'd know different things. And so allowing them to exchange information, that turns out to be quite powerful. And so when we did this, this is just showing rank. It's a ranking in which six is high and one is low. Um, and we found that uh, this P3BO method was able to consistently uh, basically perform the best over 105 different tasks, whereas other methods typically didn't perform as well. Um, and this is sort of just showing an example optimization trajectory. We can see that nice P3DA method really forging a head. And it's sort of cheating because it's basically combining all the other methods. So it should always do more or less as well as those other methods. Um, and so we can see that even in cases where model-based optimization wasn't succeeding, our P3, this is this ensemble method where we're exploring the batch is able to do pretty much as well as the best population member. Um, there's also an adaptive version of this that we came up with. It gets really complicated when you start actually changing the algorithms as you go over different rounds um, by recombining their hyperparameters and mutating them and it all gets a bit much. Um, but essentially you can eke out like a tiny bit more performance uh, by being sort of doing some, some fancy things. Um, technically it does better over the, the task, but it doesn't do better by all that much. Does, however, both adaptive and normal P3BO allow us to find more diverse sequences? So this is showing like a PCA or a TST of the best sequences found by each method. And you can see that whereas those found by evolution or by uh, this single mutant walker approach are clustered in this space, those found by the blue and orange methods here are really spread all over this entire uh, plot, reflecting their diversity. And that we thought was actually quite exciting. And so finally, I'm going to talk briefly about this uh, experimental collaboration in which we were able to use these approaches to find highly diverse sequences that were far away from the starting point. And so this was a collaboration with a group from Harvard that have uh, been working on AAV gene therapy and the challenge of designing diverse capsids. And they since actually, well, during the collaboration, they started a startup and that startup actually is doing extremely well. Um, and so we're really excited that there's some chance that some of the uh, approaches developed here might actually make it into translation and into the clinic. But essentially AAV based gene therapy uh, can now treat chronic genetic disease. Um, there are a couple of key challenges here. We need to prevent uh, the capsid and its cargo being attacked by the host immune system. So we have to evade neutralizing antibodies. And we also ideally it would be great to be able to deliver the DNA cargo to specific tissues or cell types that you're interested in. If you can make it addressable, that would be a lot more effective. Right now, a lot of the getting the uh, gene therapy to go to the liver or the spleen is really easy because that's how the body clears stuff that it doesn't want. Um, and that's all well and good if you're targeting a disease where you want the gene therapy to go to the liver or the spleen, but if you don't, then it's kind of a pain. Um, these are difficult phenotypes to work on, uh, in part because they're difficult to test in a high throughput manner. And so we started off instead by focusing on a packaging phenotype. So essentially, we want if we're going to make versions of this capsid gene or protein, we want them to fold into the right monomer structure, roughly speaking, and assemble into this beautiful highly symmetric capsid. And so 60 copies of this single protein have to come together to form this object. It's extremely large. 
So simulating the effect of mutations is pretty much intractable. Um, and this, this structure is also quite complicated. So, you know, the multiple copies really interdigitate with each other. There's lots of interfaces um, and it's, it's really a difficult design task. So when we started working on this, I thought this was crazy. Um, I still kind of think it's slightly crazy. Uh, and I do think that machine learning has provided a new approach to this problem that uh, has some success. So we're gonna be making changes to this protein in particular, we're actually gonna make changes in this small region here which we call tile 21 as a proof of principle, simply because the method of synthesizing different variants only allows us to synthesize stretches of DNA of restricted length, as so you have to kind of stick them together in order to change large parts of the protein. And so the whole protein was divided into tiles, which was sort of roughly speaking the length of an oligo. Uh, in this case, this is 30 amino acids, so it's an oligo of about 120 base pairs, including primers. You can now do longer sections, but still 300 base pairs is roughly speaking the upper limit. Um, and we were going to test both single mutants in that region and multi mutants. And this nice diagram shows the experimental process whereby this DNA is synthesized and then built into a plasmid library. And so we have a sort of initial library where we know the number of copies of each variant. And then there's a sort of big one pot assay in which every variant in the library is uh, turned into a virus and put through a round of viral replication. And at the end, we measure the number of copies of each variant that have made it uh, through that round of viral replication, which means that they would have had a intact integral capsid. So we only keep the DNA that's inside a capsid uh, and degrade away the capsid and just extract the viral DNA. Um, and so we're really asking, you know, how many copies were there to start with and how many copies were there at the end? We measure this selection coefficient, uh, which is that the ratio of those two numbers, and often we'll report this as a logarithm. So this is the region we're looking at in the structural context, and this is colored by surface accessibility. So you can see that part of the region uh, is very accessible. It's on the surface, and part of it is really buried, uh, in this case, in the interface between two different monomers. Um, so uh, sort of the first half of the tile, this is an amino acid, uh, well, this is in roughly speaking, the order of the amino acids is relatively buried. Second half is much more exposed and it turns out easier to mutate. And of course there's 60 copies of this particular section in this large structure um, and they're dotted all over the place, as you can see. Uh, naturally, there is variability in this region. So this is an alignment of 238 homologous dependent virus sequences. Um, you can see that you know, there, there, is some, there is some variability um, and uh, we do compare, roughly speaking, there's 11 mutations relative to the standard wild type AAV. Uh, and if we look at the mean plus or minus uh, twice the standard deviation, it's something like 23 mutations in this region. So it is mutable, um, but we wanna go beyond that. And this is what happens if we make all single mutations. Uh, these are the positions in the tile, and these are the 20 amino acids. And we can see that really here in this early part of the tile, it's very difficult to make mutations. The dark blue indicates that uh, those variants didn't work. Whereas in the later part of the tile here, it's much easier to change things. And so we started off with a very simple additive baseline model where we design multi mutants by combining mutations with good single site outcomes. Um, and then really try and you know, carry out this process of walking in the space in order to, you know, guided by this very simple model. Um, and we tested 56,000 sequence designs. We found that we basically had a binary outcome. Um, of course, you know, this ratio is quantitative, but essentially there was a bunch of noise in the assay, which you generally find with any sequencing based assay. Um, and we found that with the controls, we basically could tell if a sequence was viable or not. Um, and our additive model did reasonably well, but as we get further away, as we take more steps in the space, its precision or its ability to find uh, viable mutants really drops off. And so we're focusing on trying to do better in this region where we're sort of seven plus mutations away from that wild type sequence. We built a few different machine learning models, a very simple logistic regression model, a convolutional neural network and a recurrent neural network. 
uh, you can see the number of parameters really increases rapidly. Um, and so you might expect the logistic regression model to do really well when it has limited training data. But we actually found curiously that that wasn't necessarily the case. So here we gave the model just 3,000 training sequences and evaluated it on a lot of data that was further away from the starting point. And surprisingly, the just the logistic regression model actually doesn't do as well as the neural networks, even in this limited data setting, which I still don't totally understand exactly what's happening there. So we sort of wanted to then um, design sequences using these models. This is just showing you sort of retrospective validation. We wanted to do this prospectively. So we made models using three different training sets, three different architectures. So we had nine different combinations. Um, and we then carried out this process of first ranking sequences using each model, and then actually evolving the sequences using each model. There was like a bunch of compute involved in this whole exercise um, in order to design, uh, roughly speaking, a thousand sequences for each model at each distance uh, from wild type. There's like a lot of bookkeeping, basically, in order to keep track of all these sequences. But when we did this, we found that um, this plot shows our additive model in gray. Um, this is trained, all these models are trained using just 3000 sequences that are close to the wild type. And the additive model does, you know, as, as we sort of saw before, reasonably well, but the neural network models actually do quite a lot better. Uh, they're able to find, reliably find sequences that are 12 or even 15 steps away from that wild type sequence uh, and even get sort of further. Uh, what we did find is if we had more training data, then we could sort of push this out a bit further. I think I'll show that, yeah, on the next slide. The logistic regression model remarkably trained on the sort of medium sized data set did incredibly well at finding distant sequences. Um, so it seems like that model can do well, it just isn't particularly reliable. Um, whereas the neural networks appear to be more robust, uh, which again is a bit surprising given that how many parameters they're fitting. Um, in addition, I have a sort of bunch of information here that I'll skip through quickly about where the models are making mutations. Um, what we found overall, I would say, is that the logistic regression sequences were not as diverse. So you can see here that the sequences that we evolved using those models are closely grouped in a sequence space, and it's hard to see on these plots. So we kind of quantified this by counting the number of clusters uh, where the model was able to design diverse, uh, design viable sequences. We can see that there's really kind of a, a factor of 10 difference between the logistic regression model and the neural networks, even though this model, the logistic regression model is highly accurate. So it just sort of fixates a bit on areas of sequence space. We could probably fix that by having a diversity penalty. Um, uh, but for the neural networks, we didn't need to enforce that. Um, and we found the same pattern across the three different uh, training sets. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I didn't do such a great job of leaving time. Uh, we were lucky to work with some really great people, including Alex Bateman and Jane and Mystery at EBI, who really enabled us to, to, to work on the PFAN data in a way that's been very exciting. Um, and also with our collaborators from Harvard, who founded this company uh, called Dino Therapeutics that is taking these kind of approaches into the clinic. Um, thanks for listening. I'd be more than happy to ask, answer any questions.